Hello and welcome back to another rousing edition of Spy Hard's podcast, Spy Master Interviews. I'm Agent Scott. And I'm Cam the Provocateur. And we are continuing our discussion on this week's film, Spy Game, directed by Tony Scott. And Cam, we have a very special guest joining us. Yes, we do. Cinematographer Dan Mendel, who was uh, Tony Scott's frequent director of photography and worked on, you know, some little spy films you may have heard of, like Spy Game, maybe Enemy of the State, and then also working with J.J. Abrams' Mission Impossible 3. Uh, yeah, just just some light spy credentials there, I guess. Mm-hmm, really, yeah. Yeah, we probably shouldn't even have him on the show. <laughs> And that's not to mention he also worked with J.J. Abrams on Star Trek 2009, Star Trek Into Darkness, Star Wars The Force Awakens, Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker, and also films like Shanghai Noon, Zoolander 2, Pacific Rim Uprising. I mean, the list goes on. This man has done it all when it comes to cinematography in Hollywood. Definitely, yeah. So I think this is going to be a really exciting conversation. There's no shortage of ground for us to cover. No, we definitely get into it with him, and he was nothing but generous with his time. But Cam, let's stop playing this spy game. Roll the interview. And we are joined by the man himself, Mr. Dan Mindell. How are you doing, Dan? I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me, and um, let's go. We, we've got a ton of films to talk about, because you have, uh, you've done a lot of spy films, uh, and uh, that's all we ever talk about. So... Um, I think before we jump into the films specifically, I want to get to know your story a little bit. So the first question I always like to ask when we have anyone on the show is how did you get into working in cinema? Um, when, I, when I sort of left school, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. And um, I figured out a way of doing it. And um, in England at the time, uh, it was a very unionized industry, so it was a little tricky to navigate. But um, I was so lucky. Uh, I got in the the union. I, I found myself a group of people that were able to uh, mentor me, and um, I was in. Um, I started sort of on the top floor, uh, really, which was fantastic. I was exposed to Ridley and Tony Scott very early on in my uh, life and uh, became good friends and colleagues and um, that was it really. Well your first you know official credit on IMDb was on The Hunger. Mm -hmm. like, how did that job come about? <laughs> yeah I, I, I was maybe 20 years old and I was a uh, I was the guy the cleaner, T slash T boy, at this studio in London, and um, one of the guys that one of the crew members that came in on a commercial that was shooting there, I knew quite well, and um, he knew that I wanted to get in the camera department, and he said to me, "Would I like to come and help out on the hunger uh, for a few days?" and um, that's what I did. I went down there, uh, jumped in, and um, I met a bunch of people, uh, one of which was um, Tony Scott, and the other was um, Huey, a guy called Huey Johnson. Um, and uh, they became lifelong friends and uh, basically kicked me off, so to speak. You know, kind of stepping back before, I guess, The Hunger, then do you remember, like, the moment when you realized, like, cinematography was for you? Like, that was kind of what pulled you in? Oh, yeah. Uh, I, as a child, I was always playing around with my father's still cameras and um, eight millimeter cameras. And um, I was brought up in South Africa, uh, which didn't have TV uh until probably the late 70s and so uh everything was in the cinema or you had a projector at home and you looked at 16 mil prints at home and uh from from then on i've always been interested in photography and um it just seemed to me uh, well actually I, I started working with some still photographers in, in london as a cam as a stills assistant in the fashion business and I realized this is so boring. 
uh, you, the camera can actually move. It doesn't have to sit still. And at that point, I, I realized that I wanted to learn about motion picture as opposed to still picture. And I changed my uh, trajectory and got involved in the cinema or first in commercials and then the cinema. And um, uh, to this day, I refer to a lot of the lessons I learned making commercials, which is a far a trickier prospect than making movies in order to tell the story. You know, like 30 seconds to tell a story is it's a great training ground to to learn the, the graphics and, and the photographic nature of uh, storytelling, long form. You mentioned um, being raised in South Africa and not really, there wasn't TV there, so film was basically the medium in which you consumed mm -hmm. this type of stuff. You, you only saw it in the cinema or you would watch home movies at home. Are there any films that like are touchstones for you, thinking back to those times, some of your favorites? Well, you know, the other side of the, the conversation is the fact that most anything that was vaguely um, uh, contemporary was generally banned by the, the government. Mm -hmm. So what wasn't banned was usually Disney movies, uh, animated Disney movies. I mean, um, Bambi was banned in South Africa, believe it or not. Don't ask me why, I, I couldn't tell you. Mm. But uh, I was br brought up on a staple of those animated films and things like The Sound of Music and uh, giant kind of kids style movies that didn't allow any room for any kind of political statement or anything. So it was only when I um, started seeing TV in England that I became absolutely fascinated with all the sort of Sunday, Monday night movies that were on TV. And um, God, I love those films that, that they used to show because there were only two or three channels and they didn't have much stuff to put on them. So it was generally a diet of US Westerns, US kind of World War II movies, British, uh, you know, love stories and just fantastic stuff. Um, yeah, I, I still love watching <laughs> those films. Now, when you go to work, you know, with Tony Scott, you start with The Hunger, but you proceed just for the next few years doing movies like Crimson Tide, The Fan, Revenge, as well as you're working with Ridley Scott on movies like G.I. Jane and I think White Squall. Mm -hmm. I'm really interested because I think especially in that era, people looked at Ridley Scott and Tony Scott very differently in terms of the types of filmmakers they were. I'm just really interested as someone who's working with them, sort of what influence they have on your you know, evolution as an artist, but also just how different are their processes or are they very similar in terms of the way they tackle a film? I think both of them are directly responsible for influencing the look and feel of contemporary cinema. Um, they changed the lay of the land for most everybody. And in a way, I think that when they moved to the US, they, they liberated the American film industry from this kind of mundane sort of repetitive stuff that was going on. And this was basically at a commercial level because Tony was still a commercial director. He hadn't made uh, any of the movies he, later went on to make in the US and, and Ridley had much more or many more credentials in the movie world. But uh, Ridley was always considered the storyteller or the long form guy. And Tony was considered very vapid with his graphics and uh, people really misjudged, I think, because it, if you look at contemporary movies now, so many people imitate his style still. And mm -hmm. that tells you a lot. I mean, um, Ridley, not so much. He's turned into a sort of um, just a machine that, that churns out movies. But nevertheless, what I picked up from them at the time and, uh, uh, you know, it's embedded in my 
DNA is the techniques that, that they learned as commercial filmmakers. Um, and they taught everybody around them. And so the alumni is pretty huge of people that came into contact with them. But um, I, I was very lucky to be close to them in close enough to have had um, Ridley allow, or I have Ridley's, um, um, what's the word? Uh, he enabled me to get US citizenship. He enabled me to get into the US uh, as a film technician. And that changed my entire life, being able to work here in the US and work my way through the industry uh, at the level that I was allowed to go at. Um, I was so lucky, really. Mm -hmm. And you're working on, you know, several Tony Scott films doing like assistant camera. Mm -hmm. And I'm just really interested in the transition from doing assistant camera working with Tony Scott to being called upon to do Enemy of the State as the director of photography. Um, well, guys like, like Tony and Ridley and the people that came after them realized that the cinematographer um, was an enabler for the director and the directors that knew about cinematography or photography didn't really need a camera, a, a, a cameraman as such. Uh, they just needed uh, like a hybrid gaffer because someone like Tony would actually direct the lighting. Uh, he'd direct everything. That was his MR. Um, so as a focus puller, I was the guy that sat next to him when he was looking through the camera. Well, both of them. And um, ha having come perhaps from a different um, culture to the English, the sort of culture that they were surrounded by, my work ethic uh, was very different from the people around me. So when Tony said, hey, move the thing over there, I'd jump up and go and move the thing over there. And hey, someone do that, I'll get up and go and do that. And, uh, and uh, eventually, he would just ask me to do everything. And um, at one point, he, um, he phoned me and said, uh, do you want to do this movie? I, I had been shooting commercials and, uh, you know, independent films and I'd worked on TV and stuff like that, but I'd never ever done any long form like that um, or, or at that level. And um, basically, uh, when, when he asked me, I said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not ready. I, I don't want to take that responsibility. I can't do that. And he said, um, well, you can, but um, uh, okay. Uh, he said, um, that's cool. And so a few days later, um, I got a postcard from him that on it, he said, um, I owe you the next. And so the next picture was Enemy of the State. And um, I was, I was, you know, invited in and um it you know looking back on, on it now um shooting a hundred million dollar movie straight out of the wrapper in those days was pretty uh, kind of unusual i suppose and i th while i didn't face any any kind of backwash from the technicians and the people around me i i had fabulous support and I do know that people looked at me sideways uh, because I didn't know what I was doing. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I knew a lot of stuff, but I didn't know how American movies were made. And well, let me rephrase that. I didn't know how American movies were made by being when one is the DP. I'd worked on movies as an assistant and I knew all of that, but uh, this was a whole different thing. And um, basically, Tony uh, 
he held my hand and um, he guided me through and um, uh, we became closer and tighter as um, in our working relationship and um, he just taught me everything he knew and allowed me to experiment at a level that you don't really see or didn't see in those days. Um, he would cover for all the technical disasters and things that happened by enabling, enabling me to do that. And that was just a, a gift you cannot put a price on. And I mean, Enemy of the State, just technically, is a very big movie. It's not like you're starting on, you know, maybe a more leisurely romantic comedy or something. There are so many moving parts in mm -hmm. Enemy of the State with all the surveillance stuff. And it's a chase film and heavy on action. So it must have just been a <laughs> somewhat daunting task. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I reckon for me, I... I I, I had the know-how and I knew what he wanted to do visually. And I came at him with some suggestions early on and he just loved them. And um, what I learned there was um, if you can give a, a director like that freedom to shoot in any direction at the change of a hat, most, most movies are, most sequences are designed um, uh with the cam uh, camera in mind looking this way and you go wide medium tight this way then you change turn around and go that way tony was doing 360 degree shots and he was panning over here and he had like half a dozen cameras going at the, the same time and all those things were just uh different um methods that uh, he, he was just dying for someone to enable him to use all simultaneously. And so uh, I, I suggested to him, I mean, st stupidly, uh, not, I didn't know anything about it, but I said, well, Gordon Willis used to love top lighting his movies. And um, I, I said, well, why don't we try and top light everything so that we don't have stands around the room and all that kind of stuff so that you can move around and he went oh yeah brilliant let's do that and it opened so many cans of worms doing that it, it became uh, a real um challenge to to make that happen but god i learned so much by doing that and the the um the fact that it's all film, um, it, except for the the satellite point of, points of view, which was really the first time a movie used digital cameras to do what we did. What 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 um, I suggested to him was that we um, we use you know those um, uh, traffic helicopters that yeah. film car chases and all that kind of stuff. Um, the early versions of those were really the first helicopter mounts where the, the camera could look straight down and do a 360 up, up to the very, well, to that point, we didn't have a motion picture camera that could do that. And I suggested to him, why don't we just get one of those systems and try it out, which we did and, and we, we, although it wasn't a digital camera, it was a, a analog video camera. We put a digital deck in the helicopter and tried to up res it as much as we could. And um, because we knew he was going to do all the visual effects on it uh, or the graphics. And we, um, I mean, we came up with this thing and it, it changed everything. Um, mm -hmm. And so in that sense, as a, as a, an instructor and as a, um, sort of mentor and enabler, I've, I've never met anyone, uh, that has the knowledge and the sort of depth of, um, technical, uh, ability to allow that to happen until I met JJ, who's very similar in his, 
his mindset. Right. And I've always been curious with Tony Scott because I would have to imagine with his work, there has to be a lot of meticulous pre-planning, but his movies, when you watch them, feel like they're just carrying you from the seat of the pants. Does he leave room for like improvisation or like moments just on the set being like, okay, I've got an idea. Let's do this. Let's figure it out right now. Absolutely. Um, more, more, more than anyone I know, he would plan very, very carefully. So we would literally go location scouting and he would have all his stuff around his neck and in his fishing vest. And the sequence of events would be we would arrive on a location. He would get out with his compass, check the, the, the direction of the light. And if it was light, then everyone else, if it was right, everyone else could get out and we would talk about it. If it wasn't, he'd get straight back in the car and move on. He wouldn't even think about it. And basically that, that was the beginning point for everything. Where does the sun go? What does it do? And, and once he had that, yeah, this will work. No, it won't. Let's go. And then, you know, the sequences, as I said, were meticulous because he would storyboard them incredibly well. And we would basically start with that as a plan. But I mean, things, he would bring in six cameras and then that we'd have to move something over there and that would change that. And then we'd move. But he would, like Ridley does now, he would know how he was going to edit from each camera to camera. And so someone would stand up out of that camera into this camera and that would be useless, switch it off or go look at his feet or do something. And that's what he encouraged on set for all the operators and everything. Just, you see something, shoot it. And, um, editorially you can see that in the films uh, and you can see how his style developed from kind of zooming and tracking to panning to to rotating to spinning to hand cranking to uh, you know a, a fabulous fabulous mind well you are, are actually our first cinematographer we've ever had on the show. We've had screenwriters, directors, but you are the first. We thought we'd start with the best. So I'm glad you're here, Dan. Silver tongue um, devil. Well, <laughs> well. Um, so what we want to try and do for all the films we mentioned today, I'm going to ask a question and see if we can find the answer. Okay. What is your favorite shot? We're talking about Enemy of the State first. Ooh. What is your favorite shot of Enemy of the State that you put together? And maybe what was the challenge you overcame putting it together? My God, uh, there's a lot in there, but um, there's one one setup I always refer to uh, where we are tracking through a tunnel with um, Hackman and uh, Will Smith in the car. And we are looking through the driver's window and head on at the same time. And the, in those days, it was film cameras and the one camera looking through the passenger window, the profile, the window was closed. And so the reflections of the um, fluorescence in the tunnel, or not the reflection, the effect of the uh, um, fluorescence was doing this over the, over the window. And um, the camera has an eyepiece. And if you don't close the eyepiece, you can expose the film through the eyepiece. And so we did this very fast tracking shot through the tunnel and the eyepiece was left open by mistake. And the eyepiece was looking straight up at the fluorescence in the ceiling. Every time a fluorescent went over the eyepiece, it exposed the, or it just halated the film. Mm. And so when you look at the actual movie, you'll see the car's going through the tunnel and the light's doing this, and it looks like we planned it. Mm. But it's a total accident. And, um, you know, that taught me that. Well, something that, that uh, 
Tony always said is that the, the, the magic that you get comes out of the accidents that happen on set. And so when that happened, he, he didn't lose his mind and chop someone's hand off. He, he went, let's have a look at it and see what it is. And that's something that taught me a huge amount um, in terms of taking risks and doing things you're not supposed to do. Uh, in order to get something exciting to happen. Well, it just goes to show that um, there was a lot of trust on that set. And that's, uh, that, that, that can give some very interesting results. And it clearly did with Enemy of the State. I did have one more Enemy of the State question okay. that we actually got through um, a listener of the show, Dave, who sent a question into us about it. He asks, uh, and this, this might be, you may know the answer, you may not. It, was it the intention that Enemy of the State was somewhat of a follow-up to the conversation? Because they would reference it yeah. in the film. There would be shots yeah. of Hackman yeah. as a younger man. Uh, totally. Uh, we shot the same locations. Um, yeah. Uh, the conversation of the conversation, or the, com- the, the conversation about imitating the conversation was never really very overt uh, to use mm. spy language. Um, hmm. But uh, Appreciate it. <laughs> but um, it was definitely something that he wanted to do. Uh, but basically, the message is the message. And uh, it, it's still pertinent today. And uh, it, it was fascinating because we had some real spies working with us to show us the technology and all that kind of stuff it it, it was huge these nsa chats that's another whole story well the film we're talking about this week and i think it's what initially brought us to to contact you is Mm -hmm. your next i think on on your credits is that your next follow-up you actually did uh, shanghai noon in between Mm -hmm. and then we're at spy game Mm -hmm. back with tony scott now how did that relationship continue? Was, was, were you called immediately when he had the film? How did that start off? Um, I can't really remember how it started, <laughs> but, but I do know that um, uh, basically we spent our, most of our time during the year in between um enemy of the state and whatever else was going on shooting commercials and for his company um and in those commercials we would try different techniques out in order to use for the movies that he had coming up so you know we we were messing around with hand crank cameras we were messing around with uh, bleach bypass and we were messing around with DIs which hadn't really started on movies they were still uh, uh, kept, it was still a commercial thing, movies were colour timed uh, photochemically and um, so all these conversations were going on while we were doing commercials and he never really intimated until he had it locked what what was going to happen and having sort of dual nationality and working in the US and being able to work in the UK uh, it was very easy for me to be the guy that could literally go with him and continue the conversation in the UK and so that movie um, was going to be was supposed to be um, Berlin and he was offered um, Hungary, Budapest and London and um, so we went to England and we started building sets in England and we scouted Oxford where he shot, where we shot China. Uh, out in the streets of of Oxford and in the old prison in Oxford was the prison uh, that Brad Pitt was in in China. I've been in there. I did not know that. I've been in that that prison. Yeah, it's a hotel now or something. Yeah, it is. 
I was, I was there a few years back. That's blown my mind. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> and if you look at it carefully, you'll see bits of Oxford in the street. Um, anyway, uh, it, it just kind of fell in like that, uh, pretty, pretty naturally. Um, he, um, he had his team and we were first choice and, and uh, how lucky we were for that. I would love to know in terms of Spy Game, I think, I mean, it's a beautiful looking movie and I love how, you know, each location you go to, um, <laughs> there's a completely different, you know, color palette mm -hmm. to whether it's, you know, Beirut or West Germany. And I would just love to know about, you know, talking to Tony Scott, figuring out what the, you know, the palettes are going to be for each of these locations. Well, um, in those days, the color palette was what, what, what we did on Enemy of the State was um, the movie took place around Christmas in, on the East Coast and the weather's really dismal and horrible. And we deliberately sh shot it very monochrome, but the only color that we wanted to put in there were Christmas lights and decorations and the rest was just monotone and we we went from that to spy game where we knew we were going to be in different locations and we wanted to affect the the mood using you know the limited photo uh, chemical uh knowledge that we had and so uh beirut uh we we went and scouted actually northern israel on the border of Lebanon and the Antifada started. And so we had to move those locations to Tang uh, to Casablanca in Morocco, where the architecture was fundamentally different and everything was different. We had to redress all of that, that and color it and work out the palette, um, which we, you know, in a naive way, I suppose, we kind of made it a khaki colored thing. Um, knowing that we were going to have to cheat um, Vietnam in Morocco, we found an oasis and we we just could not control the ambient light there. So that was the first time we did a DI in a movie was that sequence, the Vietnam sequence in Spygate. Um, Stefan Sonnenfeld, did the coloring for us and um that, that was an epic uh, event really um mm -hmm. and uh budapest and um the streets the midwinter really dictated itself how, what it was going to look like dismal severe and uh, communist Maybe just um, maybe it should have been a question I asked earlier on, but for people like me who don't know much about how films are put together, when Tony calls you to come in and, and to help put this together as, as a cinematographer, where does the director's vision end and your input begins and what actually frames the shot? How, how do they go to care of, like making the vision of the film? Where, where do you collaborate at that stage? Well, we basically speak the same language, which is... Um aspect ratio, lens size, and that's the sort of um, thread that runs through the conversation. I know what he's talking about before he finishes the sentence because we, on a daily basis for years, that's what we do. We change lens, oh, let's put the 80 on, or let's do this, let's do that. Um, but what happens early on with a, with a guy like that, the he used to hire um, his designer or a designer to do location photographs for him uh, in order to find where he was going to set the story. And a lot of the mood would come from those initial location photographs. And those would be the ones that would catch his eye. And specifically, it would be backlight, reflections, dust in the air, stuff, just, and he would start building a mood book 
uh, for each sequence. And uh, he would, we would sit and look at it and, oh, I really like this, I really like that. And then we'd talk about what kind of film we're going to use and what the people are wearing and who are the actors and how we're going to make them fit into this space for him specifically for for tony the heightened reality is really important and the storytelling through the camera is just at the in those days was massively significant um in as much as the words as well really so you, he comes to you with the sort of like a mood book almost mm -hmm. for the different sequences does does Tony, I suppose, but also other directors you've worked with down the line as well, do they provide uh, storyboards as well? Or is that something you help in the creation of framing the shot, even in a storyboard form? Well, a lot of that has changed now because with these giant um, effects movies, uh, they have to have the effects part of the movie all mapped out. And um, finding a look for those kind of things usually comes from the concept art. And so modern movies, concept art have become basically the lookbooks for the movies because it's just basically that's how it flows now. Um, I mean, you, obviously you still get photographs of star, different places and things that go in the movie, but Tony used to walk around with a, a, a little snapper camera, like a, what do you call it? An inst not an instant camera. A, uh, anyway. Like a 35 mil? Yeah. Like yeah. A, yeah. And he'd have a pocket full of film and we'd go on location. He'd shoot all the stills and you'd get the angle and then he'd process it and then print it. And, and that was really the, the okay, we're, two years later we'd go to the location and he's got the photograph. Okay, this is where the camera's gone. Um, very specific. Um, that kind of specificity is gone. Um, people are much more kind of loose about it now. Well, with Spy Game, you're also shooting, you know, Robert Redford throughout mm -hmm. this movie, who's a director in his own right, a very accomplished director. Was he, I mean, was he very like, kind of just leaning back and just following Tony Scott's vision or did like Robert Redford have ideas? Was he putting anything forward? Well, Yes, yes, and yes. I mean, thoroughbred Hollywood royalty actor. So he knows the protocols. He knows the, the um, you know, what's the word? The, 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 he would never suggest anything without doing it the right way in order to make the movie better. So he was fastidious about his performance and about what about learning his lines but the protocols of adding to the movie with someone like tony are very regimented you can't just say hey i've got an idea let's do this you you got to kind of mm -hmm. talk talk him into it and um but redford was fascinated with tony's procedure and how he did it so for an actor director like that it's also a learning space and i often would have conversations with redford about he would be go why is the camera so far away because he's used to it being here but tony would put on the three to one which on the long lens which uh, long end which is about a four 400 millimeter lens and he'd be like that but the camera would be way over there redford's like why is the camera over there? And, you know, I'd stand in front of it on his mark and say, go look through the camera, check it out. Um, and, and so for him, it was just as interesting to be there as it was part of his, his job. He was there and he was learning for sure. And one anecdote I came across was that Robert Redford was a little confused, maybe initially at the helicopter shot when him and Brad mm -hmm. Pitt Mm -hmm. are seated on the top of the building. I think it was in the Beirut section. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could just talk about that helicopter shot, because I mean, <laughs> that may be just one of the big visual set pieces of the movie. Um, well, there's, there's a lot going on with helicopters at this point. We use them a lot in commercials for car, 
car commercials and we, we used to shoot these giant Marlboro commercials out in Utah and the Four Corners and we would use helicopters and every tool known in the film industry, like I said, in order to try them out and see how we were going to use them in the movies. And so part of the, the process was Tony had come up with this thing where he loved putting circular track down and doing 360 moves on the dolly where the background would move behind the guy smoking the Marlboro and he'd be there and it'd be just a fantastic thing. He wanted to bring that into storytelling and that's why we were doing it there. We, we tried it out. But then he realized he could do it with a helicopter. Hmm. And so we found this location in uh, uh, Budapest and he wanted to shoot. There was some awful trouble with the dialogue with Brad and uh, Redford. It just, the scene wasn't working. Um, and there was also this helicopter involved. So it was really loud and confusing. And um, it, it wasn't going as well as it should do. But I, I think what Tony salvaged from it, it never, he, we never got it the way he wanted it. But what we salvaged was a couple of rotating helicopter shots, uh, which didn't really sort of do what he wanted it to do. But basically, he wanted to get the city spinning behind and this long lens shot of conf confusion going on. Um, that was total method to his, his madness, his plan, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I'm looking at the poster over there, and there's a picture of um, these Huey helicopters that we landed in, supposed to be in um, in China, I think, or somewhere on on the roof of these buildings, which happened to be an old Russian airbase in Hungary. And the buildings were so dilapidated they had to secure the buildings because when they landed the helicopters on the roof, the whole buildings were shaking like this, and all the actors were up there, and it was. He, he loved that. He loved the confusion because he, it made the actors really kind of uh, on edge. And you can see it. Well, I mean, the, the shot on the rooftop is definitely one of the standout moments in the film. Another thing that always jumps out to me about Spy Game is the boardroom scenes. Yeah. We talk about spy movies every single week and we've watched a lot of boardroom scenes <laughs> because spy films love them. But, I mean, this is probably one of the only times that you can say that the shots are actually interesting and keep your attention. i, I got to give it, some of that's Robert Redford, of course. The man is, mm -hmm. as you say, a, a legend. But what went into making those scenes exciting? And, you know, what did you contribute towards that? That was the most difficult thing I think we've ever done, was, was first of all, shooting a conversation around a table with a lot of people. It's really hard to keep the continuity and the angles the camera angles absolutely correct and just that part of it took us con endless conversation but then we had to build that that thing was built on set and it was just a terrible set to work on um we didn't have enough room to get the the backings away from the windows and that kind of thing and the um the idea of putting a one-way mirror in the wall where we could shoot through and be over the tape decks and all that kind of thing allowed us to cut in and out of the room uh, if we wanted to. Uh, and um, we did our kind of Gordon Willis thing again where we top lit the table. And that meant that if we could get a camera on one side and another camera on the other side we could get both sides of the conversation uh at the same time and we tried really hard to do that and as a filmmaker editing conversations like that is something that you can never ever have enough sort of footage of and so with his editing hat on he knew how he was going to cut that conversation and get it sort of um, to have some momen momentum and, and speed so that it didn't sound like actors just 
reading lines. And I think that, that that's why it works. It, it feels more or less engaging. Um, and that's probably the biggest mandate is that anything we shoot has to be engaging. Mm -hmm. And there is some really fantastic action in Spy Game and in much of Tony Scott's work. And mm -hmm. I've always been really been interested because when you watch his action, it's you know incredibly fast paced. It can often feel disorienting, intentionally so. It makes you feel like you're caught up in the action. And you would see in the you know further down the road, a lot of um, you know directors and cinematographers would try to replicate you know an evolution of the Tony Scott style of action, and it often did not work. So I'm really interested, just from your point of view, what was Tony Scott doing that a lot of maybe directors don't think of or cinematographers don't quite understand? Oh, uh, there's there's a, a few things. Um, in those days, CG was not a an option, and so the the skill of people on set to do things in camera was enormous. And so, for example, um, in Enemy of the State, when Hackman is driving the the um, his car and it's on fire, that's all real. It's not CG. Today, like when I, when I go to colleges and stuff like that and talk to the kids about CG and that kind of stuff, and I say, look at this. Is this CG? Is it real? The first thing that comes out of everyone's mouth, it's CG. But basically, there's a, a special effects guy with a, a gas pipe and a bottle, and he puts it across the thing under the camera, and you shoot. And he, when you say turn over, he lights the flame, and the car's burning and Hackman's in there and it's real. Uh, so th that kind of um, mentality goes for basically everything. So for example, in Spy Game, one of the, the sequences I love is when Brad Pitt is in the taxi driving through the city like crazy. He's telling the guy, go, go, go. That car for some of the sequence for the dialogue and that kind of stuff was on the back of the trailer. And we were towing the trailer through the city and the, Tony was making the driver go as fast as he could. And basically, I think today people would go, that's not safe. We're not gonna do that. But we were a team and we all knew how this was gonna work and we took the right precautions and did the right things and you can feel that in the in the, the camera work and in the sequence that there's nowhere to go you've got to watch it it's real it's it's happening that you know that the camera is not going to cut away that the car's going to go spinning around the corner and sometimes you hit the wall and the the camera goes like that and but he'll keep that in the film and uh there's so much to be learned. I think that the, the only person that's come close to, to taking it and running with it is Michael Bay. Mm -hmm. And Michael Bay was a huge student of Tony and Bruckheimer and those guys. He, he studied and took it. And I, I think that he's someone really important to, to keep an eye on. Well, I think before I ask the the final spy game question I have, I have one more question. You mentioned editing of mm -hmm. spy game and and this is more of an overall question of the role, but specifically spy game because it's such a stylistic film, the way it's put together in the end. What's the relationship between Tony Scott yourself and the editor on the film? How close are you working when it comes to actually shooting on set? Is the editor involved at that stage? Are you are you producing shots for them, or are they more picking up afterwards? No, um, the discipline on those sets was enormous, and as a he head of department, whether you're the editor, the DP, the the caterer, you're made to be culpable for your department and the things that go on in it, which is quite rare these days. Um, so for example, at the end of every day or the beginning of every day, we would watch dailies and we would watch dailies as a crew. So it would be Tony, me, the camera crew, the editor, 
and we would all be in dailies and we would be talking about what we shot and what was good and what was bad, how to make it better. And the editor would show us what he did the day before with what we did and that kind of stuff. Just an ongoing conversation. One of the first people I would speak to in the day would be the editor. Have you got the dailies? Did you check it out? Blah, 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 blah. And I'd have this conversation with the editor. Oh, we shot something and it, it might be a bit dark here, but just wait five seconds, it'll get brighter. Uh, that kind of culpability was really, really huge. Uh, and so um, the editor would come on set for sure. And by the way, he would have the storyboards that Tony made the day early in the day and he would see, oh, they're going to shoot this and this goes like this. Just a really fabulous process. Well, as we alluded to with Enemy of the State, now with Spy Game, what is your favorite shot from the film? And if you haven't spoken about it, maybe how you helped put that one together. Um, I'm looking at the poster because it's got a bunch of still pictures on it. <laughs> <laughs> of yeah, hey, that's cheating. <laughs> um, and I was watching a bit of it uh, on uh, YouTube the other day. Um, I really like the whole film. Um, the mood in it's really great uh, and um i think my favorite uh, sequence is when we all got in the helicopter and brad is sitting there and we're just flying through the supposedly vietnam and when we shot that there was me, Tony, the sound man, the camera operator, Brad, an electrician with a white bounce board. And we were really flying the helicopter down this valley. And it was just so much fun to, to work like that. And that, that's probably the thing that I miss the most about not working with him is that he was one of these very gung ho, uh, directors that you know he wouldn't think twice about okay let's everyone get in the helicopter let's do this shot um i love that i think it's great we interrupt this program to bring you a special report agents we have some breaking intel that's right independent podcasting is not cheap equipment hosting research these all add up and we don't have vesper lind to bail us out and also we don't want to run ads on the show Leave the shopping to Harry Palmer, we say. And this is a big reason we created the Spy Hearts Patreon. So we're here to ask for your help. Please consider joining the Patreon. You'll not only be gaining access to our exclusive lineup of reviews and film commentaries, but also helping support the show. We're currently saving to upgrade our sound equipment to meet IMF standards and give you an even better listening experience. With a wide range of flexible options and an ever-growing catalogue to dive into, Become a true spy hard today and join the circus at patreon.com slash spyhards or you can find a link in the show notes below. Now Cam, resume the spy jinx. Now I, I wanted to take us over to another one of your spy films, but I would be remiss if we didn't just speak about Tony a little bit more. Um, this it isn't you know, Spy Game isn't your last film with him. You've gone to do Domino, but could you just speak a little bit more about just working with Tony Scott, maybe some anecdotes from working with him or just what that relationship was like and what it meant to you? There's some, so many uh, anecdotes that are inappropriate and <laughs> they, Perfect. they haven't aged <laughs> well. And, um, you know, like I said, he was a man's man on set or in life. He was had a huge presence and um so a lot of people found him very intimidating and um were i don't want to say afraid but just kept their distance and um the thing that i carry with me and i try to teach the kids around me and my own kids and anyone who wants to listen is that the fundamental I learned from him, and, and it's not about cinema or, well, I suppose it is in a way, but his his mantra was never give in. Never, ever give in. If something's not right, 
fix it. If it if it's the light's not right, find find it where it's light. And that goes for everything we did. And I just um, I I often reminisce about those moments where the wheels are coming off and everything's going absolutely ratchet. And you just take a second and think about what's going on, how to correct the situation and make it work. And, and that to me came from him and he learned that because he was an avid mountain climber. Right. And he took control of his own life with the things he did. And he liked everybody around him to have that same kind of idea that, okay, this guy's asking me to climb on the roof and do a shot from here with the thing. It's not safe. I, I need my mum to hold my hand. This is not right. He, he wouldn't ask you to do anything he wouldn't do himself. And I find that very, very um, kind of insightful, especially in modern times now, you know, that um, on set, uh, sometimes you you have to de you have to demonstrate as the head of department that what you're asking people to do is it's not dangerous it's it's not um, unnecessary uh, it's to make the movie better and uh, and you know and, and the 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 idea of never asking anyone to do something you wouldn't do yourself I think is the thing that for me I carried away from the whole many years of, of relationship before we uh, I, think, I think we'll move on to the next director you worked with and still continue to work with and that is mr jj abrams and of course you work with him on mission impossible 3 now i, I will direct our listeners over to light diffuse podcast who actually had an interview with yourself a couple of years ago now and they really went in depth about mission impossible 3 so we won't go into it too much because they really really spoke about it a lot with you but what i'm curious to know about is sort of how you got involved with the project and jj abrams himself um jj saw enemy of the state uh, and liked the way that was photographed and he phoned me and asked me if i wanted to come and talk to him and i didn't know who he was um, he was mainly involved in um, episodic work at that point. And um, when I met him, it was like getting into a room with a hurricane. He was just so excited and, and inspiring. Um, we just hit, had a meeting of the minds there and then. And um, I, he asked me how we did that. And I said, we... We shot anamorphic uh, film and blah, blah, blah. And he said, okay, let's, let's go. Let's do this. And uh, that's how it started. And um, I'm just really interested to know, you know, you're coming off of the first Mission Impossible, which Brian De Palma did, and the second one, which John Woo did, which are incredibly distinct visually. I'm just really interested to know about the conversations you're having with J.J. Abrams about visually where do you want to take Mission Impossible? Well, you know, the, 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 the mandates uh, for those sort of franchises are incredibly heavy duty. You know, it's like the Bond mandates and all those kind of things. Everything's got to be that way for that movie and blah, blah, blah. And so when we... Um, when we started on it, uh, most everything had been set in stone, except it hadn't kind of contemporized itself in terms of dialogue and look and feel and all that kind of stuff. And JJ is like one of the main uh, directors then and now that has his finger on the zeitgeist and was able to sort of contemporize the the film with modern language and aesthetics. And so um, the idea of bringing the kinetics to the camera work and um, to the editing and to the um, 
uh, the action was really a, a combo of JJ's huge knowledge of visual effects, which I was fairly new to, and um, my ability to uh, translate the camera into sort of Tony Scott esque visuals, which is the longer lenses and the the thing like that. Anyway, uh, we 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 came upon a uh, a language that um, that worked, and um, I like it. I like that movie. I I I, I like mm -hmm. the way it looks. I think it's um, it's exciting, and um, the camera work I think is really. I'm not talking the lighting. I'm talking about the 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 way the camera moves is really fantastic and uh, i think that what he liked and wasn't able to really focus on because of the politics and and the giant uh actors involved and that kind of thing was the the minutia of the the story so when we actually got out on the road we went we shot here, we were building in Italy. We flew over to Italy once we finished here, we shot in Italy. And while we were doing that, we were building back here. We came back to the U US and then we went to China. And um, so logistically, it was, a, it was a huge thing for everybody. And um, I, I think for, for JJ to keep, the movie in the shape he did was a it was huge i think he did a brilliant job with it and uh, I'm, I'm sad it didn't kind of really really explode the the franchise but it definitely didn't hurt the franchise in any way no i i well i actually revisited it the other night just to refresh my memory before speaking with yourself and i think it it really holds up and maybe it didn't do as well as some would want it to but i think it coming back is responsible for the fact that we have two more films coming in the next couple of years. You know, after two, it was a bit iffy. So I think three put it right back on track. I think everybody learned from JJ uh, in the franchise, within the franchise, how to bring the special source. And they've just, each movie, they've amped it up more and more and more. And uh, I think the... Um, yeah, the proof of that is that it, they've ended up making them in England um, or being based in England. And, and that's because the visual effects and the stunts and all that kind of stuff are so good. Uh, and for a guy like Tom to be able to design these sequences around these um, just incredible stunts um, started with, you know, obviously early on he was riding motor motorcycles and smashing cars up and jumping off buildings and everything. Um, but the way it was covered in um, Mission Impossible Three, I think, was the first time it was it was sort of so elegant, uh, and they've maintained that all along. Well, yeah, just com to perhaps compare and contrast, you know, you've come from working with, with Tony Scott predominantly, and now this is your first time of many with J.J. Abrams. What's the, what's the set like? What's the difference between working for the two? How do they operate their sets differently? Uh, the stress level was way less on J.J.'s sets because he did not come from this authoritarian kind of, background where um, uh, hierarchy really counted. And that, that was the English system, mm. that there was a definite hierarchy on the set. And um, uh, in the US, uh, uh, it's a lot more relaxed. And on JJ sets, the mandate is that you behave the best you can you treat everybody with respect and and care and attention and that uh is the overriding factor in everything and and that, that um 
that blew my mind when I got on on his set. It was just so calm and and reasonable. Hmm. And I want to talk just a little bit about the big set piece of the movie, which is that bridge action sequence with the helicopters. Oh yeah. And I would just love to know about just the challenges of shooting that sequence. Yeah, I mean, that was supposed to be on the real causeway, which is out in Virginia or somewhere over there. Um, and we went and actually scouted it. So in my mind, we were going to shoot it live for real on the location. But we ended up in the San Fernando Valley in a field where we built some of the bridge and we shot it uh, using visual effects and green screen to to put that bridge into the environment. Um, it was an amazingly tricky uh, sequence. Uh, there were so many people involved and there was so much going on. But, um, you know, uh, the, the beauty of having someone like Tom Cruise on set when you do those kind of um, sequences is that because he does his own stunts and because he's so clued in uh, into the techniques, you can put him front and center in, in the camera. He can do all your close-ups for real. And I think that, that that helps sell the indiscretions of the uh, CG work. Mm. Uh, um, but boy, th that took us a long time to do. Well, just to keep with what we've been doing, Mission Impossible 3, looking back, what's your favorite shot from the film and how did you uh, go about achieving it? Um, I think uh, there's a lot of things I like in that film. I, I, I do like the, uh, the uh, preamble for when Tom jumps off the roof in Shanghai. Um, it was a complicated 360 degree um, crane slash um, spider cam move where he literally, the camera circles around him and then he runs and it chases him and he jumps off the side of the building. Um, I like that for two reasons. One, it was, or well, for three reasons. One, it was really, really difficult to light at night, a 360 degree shot um, like that. And two, uh, I like the fact that we built that set on top of a car park in the San Fernando Valley and used the, the valley lights in the background as part of the China landscape. And three, he, jumped off the building for real about 10 times, uh, which uh, was just spectacular. I mean, it, you know, like I said, when you have the real guy doing the stunts, it makes all the difference. Say what you are about Tom Cruise. He cares about the films he makes. Uh, you know what? He's never late. He always arrives knowing what he's going to do. And uh, he's a complete professional when it comes to the sort of, um, high, uh, the language on the set. Plus, he probably knows more than most people will ever know about A, the history of cinema, B, the techniques of cinema, and C, how to be an actor. And I think that there's, there's very few people, if any, that can do that. I remember watching a video of him uh, during, I think, the end of the first lockdown with the coronavirus and, and oh, yeah. skipping into a cinema in London, mm -hmm. the IMAX in central London, to watch Tenet. And he was he was yeah. giddy about going in to watch a film where he could have had that screened in his own house if he wanted to, but he wanted to go sure. to the cinema to watch it. Absolutely. And that's what this is all about, right? Is making engaging visuals that complement the story and get people uh, to, to uh, enjoy stories that uh, take them out of their lives and put them into this space for a couple of hours and then you go home and it's the combined experience or the, the experience of having that with an, uh, an audience or a group of people that go through the whole 
thing yourself uh, with yourself, and um, uh, it's irreplaceable. I, I personally love going to the cinema. It's my thing. You know? Couldn't agree more. Yeah, we're in the same yeah. boat. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I love your your uh, ideas, and I think uh, you know. I, I really uh, just love how this all happens and what you guys do and everyone like you. It's just brilliant. It, uh, it's very important and I congratulate you both on doing it. Thank you. Oh, no, it's our well, pleasure. I, yeah, that's, that's wrapped us up for, for spy movies that you've covered. But, <laughs> but there is a, as, as our listeners will know, uh, Cam and I, met at a star trek convention of all places so i would be remiss if we didn't uh you know dive from the enterprise straight down to the planet vulcan and talk about star trek and star trek into darkness uh, which of course you worked with jj on um i mean especially 2009 i was very much into the production of that movie i went to the premiere to both of those films they both mean a lot to me so i i've got to ask you a couple of questions about those if you don't mind sure well, I suppose you know, you've worked with JJ for Mission Impossible. How did the conversation come up where to tackle a, a, a space film? It's a completely different style of film from a spy action film or a spy series film like you would the spy game, for instance. So how did that conversation come about? Mm, I know exactly where I was. Uh, I was standing in uh, Starbucks in our local town. Uh, I was taking my kids to school uh, and I got a text in the line and it was from JJ and it said, are you gonna wanna do Trek? Hmm. That's how it started. I replied, wanna. Wow. And we went from that to, um, you know, just ha having a blast doing that film. Um, yeah, it, it, you know, uh, we might have gone a bit mental, but <laughs> I think uh, there's still people imitating that too. Yeah, well, I mean, like the lens flare look yeah, of that yeah, movie yeah. became really recognizable. And it's something they still carry on yeah. into the, like the newer Star Trek shows on streaming. like maybe not to the same degree but it's still there as a visual stamp and i'm just really curious how that sort of how did that just happen every movie every commercial every company that hires lenses out every filter company everybody how do we need flares what color do you want all this kind of stuff um so interesting um when when we when you sh basically when we were shooting Mission Impossible, um, we would get flares on the lens from different types of lighting that we were using. And um, I think there's a few flares in that film that made it through editorial that are there. And JJ um, asked me about it and um, Mostly to that point, uh, most movies try to, uh, or most DPs at that point, try to protect the lenses really heavily in order to keep them from flaring and to keep any idiosyncratic stuff happening. But uh, when we started talking about track, I said to him, you know, the thing that worries me is that it's all on set and it's all pretty boring because um there's not nothing going on lighting wise or it's just pretty mundane and um i said i suggested that we um we try to encourage lens flares and aberrations in order to take the sterility of the set away and because as a kid, I used to watch movies and the thing that would just bug the shit out of me was when they would cut from location to set and I'd go, oh, fuck, this is a movie. And <laughs> um, 
I really wanted to try and find a way of stopping that happening. And so uh, we started messing around with flares and it just we just got more and more <laughs> crazy about it. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I think, you know, we stumbled on something that was really, really great. Well, we didn't stumble. We knew it was there. There was one sequence I want to ask you about, which was in Star Trek Into Darkness, when the Enterprise is plummeting at the end, and you have, you know, Chris Pine and I believe Simon Pegg running through the hallways mm -hmm. as everything's rotating. I would just like to know about how difficult it was to shoot those sequences, because they really are just incredible. Um, we built a phenomenal set for Enterprise. Um, which was um, we had the bridge and a lot of parts of the, the ship linked by real corridors and stuff like that. But the one thing that we didn't do was use, put any of it on a gimbal mm -hmm. because JJ just di didn't want to spend the money and figured we could do it better in camera. And so a lot of those rotations and a lot of that stuff is getting the actors to react as the camera is spinning. And, you know, editorially, uh, he knows, JJ knows how to uh, manipulate the audience uh, with the visuals and the action and the, the vibration and all that kind of stuff in order to sell the, the, um, the action, but I mean, what what we did on those sets, which is basically what we learned on Enemy of the State was to build all the lighting in and make it possible to shoot in any direction at any moment uh, and not come into contact with lighting equipment. And that gave us a lot of freedom to make those sets work and use those tricks. The, the fact that the corridors are, are sort of oval or round when you're spinning the camera and people are running, you get them to run on the walls and all that kind of stuff. It really sells the thing. And Zachary and Chris and all of them were pretty young and new at the game then. And they were prepared to do a lot more stuff than the older people would have um, at that time. So they were fairly athletic about it as well. Now, yeah, a lot of people talk about the J.J. Star Trek films and they mentioned lens flare as one of the first words that comes out of people's mouths. One thing I don't think people get enough credit for, and uh, mostly uh, I say this is you, Dan, is being able to modernize the original series of Star Trek like, in an aesthetic kind of way. You, the, the visual style of how that show was shot could be quite static at times. It wasn't particularly active. You've obviously modernized it. But what was the thought process behind trying to update the original Star Trek and bring it to modern audiences. And so what did you, what development process did you go through there? Well, the, the only mandate really was to respect the good nature uh, way that those episodes were made and the films were made and what the, the characters stood for. But the aesthetic, we didn't really have many, um, parameters that we had to stick by. But I mean, what we wanted to do was contemporize the enterprise. And I think we, we were able to do that. You know, we gave it, it sort of looked like a, an, an Apple store um, mm -hmm. with all the lights and the, the reflections and the, it just looked great. It looked mm -hmm. beautiful. And uh, that, that was the mandate. Unlike Star, War, uh, Star Wars, where we weren't able to change a thing we had to stick to the book in that one but uh jj was adamant that we kept the the sort of the the soul of track together and we didn't mess with that but you know like the shirts and the the color coding of stuff like that we kept that obviously you know? and um but they were so much fun to make those films yeah we're both big fans I think you can see it in the, in the film, you know, people are having fun making them and, and that's always a good guide of 
how things are going. And and to be fair, it looks like there'll be a fourth one coming out in the next couple of years. So yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I would have loved to have seen Tarantino do one. Yeah, mm. that script is out there somewhere. I'd love to have seen yeah. what was on it. <laughs> Um, well, continuing our trend from earlier, even though this isn't a spy movie, but what was your favourite shot from the two Star Trek films that you put together and, and perhaps a little bit about that? Oh, my God. Um, I, I, I can't tell you. I mean, I think that um, the fact that we were able to um, make the Budweiser Brewery feel like the Enterprise mm -hmm. engine room, for me, was, was a really kind of... Uh, big coup that we were able to pull off and it gave the, the movie a lot of scope uh, the first time we did that and then I suppose in the second one um, I really enjoyed the, the IMAX part of those films uh, specifically the, um, the red planet you know the volcano where mm. Zach has to put the thing out. That was all practical. It was just brilliant to be able to manufacture a set that worked like that. And again, by the way, we did use helicopters to shoot some of that. You are keeping a helicopter company well in business, I think. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, if you had seen that set, uh, anyway, it, it was, I, I love the volcano, I the, the sparks and everything. That's all real. It's a great opener for the film as well. The other one I always think of is the, the fight between Khan and the crew and the Klingons. There's lots of practical stunt work there and there's like the ship suspended in the air at the top and everything. Yeah, a lot of wire work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that, that was a bit... Um, what, what, how can I put it? It was a huge, huge um, stage piece that we had to fit into uh, a couple of stages at Sony and uh, the story behind that I mean to speak to the the art the, the, the designer would be a real fun thing to do because the way that that came about uh, I we, we need another hour or two to talk about that because that <laughs> that was pretty uh, breathtaking the scope of it and that's what's really interesting about JJ is as a filmmaker his scope is massive and he's not afraid to go big when it comes to designing sequences and um, how they work um, you reminded me uh, uh, that sequence I got to look at that that was pretty uh, pretty cool it, it is a great sequence now I think that covers us for Trek, but I, I'd be remiss if I didn't also ask about the wars of it all. You did briefly mention Star Wars, and of course you did The Force Awakens and The Rise of Skywalker. Um, what was the conversation with JJ? Was it just another text message at Starbucks that brought that one around, or how did it, how did it come apart? Uh, uh, yeah, well, one of them was, uh, do you want to go to a galaxy far, far away? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> wow, what a text to get. What a text. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, they, were, they were just so heavy duty making those films. Um, the first one especially. I mean, there was so much at stake. Um, but what, what fun and what a great, great job to be given to work on something like that, especially for someone my age who saw the movie the first movie in the cinema. It was what a what a gift. Uh, I, I'll never ever forget that. Um, and again, we were allowed to use film and all the the techniques that we know and love. And uh, I think that that movie really, really uh, did what it was supposed to do. And um, I'm really uh, proud and honoured to have been involved in both. And I mean, the most iconic aspect of the Star Wars franchise is lightsaber fights. And mm -hmm. the ones in both Force Awakens and Skywalker are absolutely fantastic. I think rank near the top of the franchise in terms of lightsaber duels. I would just love to know, as someone who obviously, you know, the original Star Wars movies would have had a real impact, what it was like to shoot 
a lightsaber sequence and you know how challenging were they whether it's the forest one or the one on the wreckage uh the the one in the forest was um supposed to be in a real forest at night in the snow uh and we looked everywhere for that place um eventually we decided it was going to be on stage and there had that year been a hurricane in England and a lot of trees had been destroyed. So they were able to get hundreds of tree trunks, which were built on a set, uh, on a snowy set and uh, a painted backing, a 360 degree painted backing was put up around the set. And we had, um, um, are indeed the the lightsabers um, in terms of color and um, frequency. So when they touched mm. or hit each other, they would white out. And we had worked with the, the prop makers to to make design them so that they would do that and be strong enough to to be thrashed around the set and. Um, Basically, we sh we shot it um, like we would have done a real snowy thing. We had snow, and uh, what my one of my favorite shots in that film is that close up of um, Ray mm. with the lightsaber reflected in her eye, and uh, it's just good good stuff. Nice. Well, I think you may have answered my final question on Star Wars, which would be, which is your favorite shot and, uh, and why? But it sounds like it was that lightsaber shot. But is there any other ones that spring to mind? Um, um, maybe the first time we, uh, we walk onto the, the, um, the deck in... Um, the Falcon? In the, we see Han, yeah, we see Han walk out uh, and uh, he's, he goes... Uh, Chewy, we're home. Uh, everyone on the set just went, yeah, it, it was it was fantastic. It was great to watch the video of the Star Wars Celebration Convention where they unveiled that. <laughs> and uh, I wasn't at the convention, but I did watch the video on YouTube of just that crowd exploding at that moment. It was great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, what, a, what, a, what a gift to have done that. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, Dan, you, you, you said it at the beginning, you know, you were very blessed. You sort of, you stumbled into this in a sense, making teas. And then the next day you're, you know, DP on the enemy of the state. But, you know, you look at what you've done for cinema from Star Trek to Star Wars to all the spy films and other ones we didn't have time to mention. I don't think it's luck. I think there was a pure skill here. And I, I you know, thank you for everything you've contributed to cinema. Uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. And um, thank you in return. And the good news is, my battery is going to run out. Uh, and so uh, I look forward to hearing from you guys again one day. Awesome. So Dan, before you leave us, a couple of quick questions that everyone gets on the show from, from John Glenn to Nicholas Meyer. What is your favorite spy film of all time? Oh, I don't know about that. And you can't answer spy game. You can't that. answer spy game. No, no, I would never, ever do that. I don't think that that would be my favorite. God knows. Um, what is yours? Oof. Uh, top of my head, probably North by Northwest would be the one I would go to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty brilliant. I don't know. I, I might have to get back to you on that. I might have to think about that, uh, I, you know? Okay, second question. Best James Bond film? Yeah. I love them all. I even love the bad ones. Yeah. And they they sort of for me as important as the um Indiana Jones mm -hmm. movies because uh one of the favorite one of my favorite things about cinema is when you are 90 or 9 and you go to the cinema and the the movie takes you on a trip and shows you other countries and other places uh i just love that and that's what i love about the bond films and the crass ones and the 
the nasty ones, they all do it. And, and for me, uh, I, I have a thousand percent respect for those, those movies. So, uh, if that's a good enough answer, <laughs> I'd leave it at, at that. I think it is. And you know, the other thing I would ask is as you've worked on two each, are you a star Wars man or a star Trek man? Um, well, I, I don't know. I, 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 I guess I've got to go with Star Wars. Good answer. You said you were a man of the cinema. It's, it's probably the right answer, so I can't blame you for it. But, Dan, again, it, it's meant a lot to us both to have you on the show. We want to thank you both for taking this time to speak with us about some of our favourite films and the bunch we haven't even had a chance to speak about. So, again, Dan, thank you for your time. All right. Be well and, and take care. There you go. That was our chat with Dan Mindell. And well, Dan is the man. Yeah, that was, I mean, riveting for me. Just the amount of stories we got and technical information on the making of so many iconic movies. And I mean, you and I, when we have tackled Spy Game, we did Enemy of the State on another podcast. We'll do it on our own in the future, as well as Mission Impossible 3. But we like to really dig into the details of these movies over the course of our reviews. And it was just so fantastic to have someone more than willing to share all these little nuggets of information about the process of working with Tony Scott on those movies and just all of the projects he's worked on. And also, we've never had a cinematographer on the show before. So I was a bit worried going into the interview that, you know, he works in a very visual medium and this is an audio podcast. It's for your ears only. And I was worried it wouldn't necessarily translate, but it was nothing but insightful. Um, and I, I learned a ton about filmmaking just chatting to him. Yeah, it really was kind of a film school for people who don't really know that much about what a cinematographer does and why they're so important to film. I mean, I really think people will walk away with a renewed appreciation for his contributions to these films, as well as just like what a director like Tony Scott or J.J. Abrams is doing on these sets that makes these movies look so fantastic. And there's few people out there that you can go to and say, hey, compare and contrast between Tony Scott Ridley Scott and J.J. Abrams but this guy can his career has he's spent a lot of time working with all of them specifically Tony Scott and J.J. Abrams and he's able to tell you what those sets are like and I, I think he might be the only person you can ask that question to there's not many out there so I mean this was just a real get again congratulations Scott I think he did a fantastic job lining this one up and just as someone who grew up on Star Wars Hearing someone talk about shooting a lightsaber fight was uh, kind of indescribable. And on the flip side for me, I, I mentioned it in the interview, but I was big into Star Trek 2009. I followed the production of that like I've never followed a film in my life. I, you, know, you know my story with Star Trek. I was a lifelong fan, still am, I guess. But, you know, there was that gap in time between 2004 when it went off the air and 2009 when the film came out. I had nothing. So when this this film was being made, I watched every trailer several times. And to hear just about the passion behind creating that film that you could tell was on screen, but just to have the chance to speak to him, um, I, I think it's one of the highlights of this entire show for me. And it wasn't even about a spy movie, but you know, let's not dwell on that. Well, and whether you're talking about Star Trek or Star Wars, he created a lot of iconic images that have only added to what the canon of those franchises mean to viewers going forward. People will, in decades going forward, look back on the work he created. And speaking of trailblazing, you look at films like Spy Game, Enemy of the State, they're really setting up what action spy films look like in the 21st century. You know, Born Identity takes a lot from things like Enemy of the State and Spy Game in terms of that quick cut that, that Tony Scott was doing long before, you know, Doug Liman was doing it. Yeah, the Tony Scott you know, approach to action filmmaking was just, it was often reviled at the time of when he was making those movies. And now it's kind of really, it's been so crucial to the development of action on the big screen, you know, stuff like those Bourne films, the way that even Paul Greengrass was shooting action, it in many ways feels like an evolution of what Tony Scott was doing and that Dan Mandel was, you know, helping develop along with him. And he, he referred to himself as like an enabler to Tony Scott. Yeah. But that's kind of what, in my definition, in my head of what cinematographers do. They get a vision and they help create it and bring it to the screen. And, and enable is just another word for it, I suppose. But, you know, I, I also really enjoyed the fact that, you know, 
for a long time we've had people saying, hey, why are you not doing Mission Impossible yet? Yeah. Now, me and Cam have an agreement, and we know when we're going to start tackling Mission Impossible, and here's a hint, it's not going to be for a while. This was like a subtle way of us having a quick chat about our love of one of the Mission Impossible films. So it was just quite nice for me to have that moment about, with you and with Dan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, that is a franchise that also is incredibly iconic. And hearing him talk about just shooting that bridge sequence, that attack sequence, was just fascinating to me. And I do look forward to doing more deep dives on Mission Impossible in the future, but this was a great appetizer for that. And we can always point back to it when we eventually get to Mission Impossible 3. That's right, that's right. Um, but yeah, this is a, a very long interview. We thank you all for sitting down with us and listening. And we also, again, thank Dan for taking the time to chat with us. Um, so I think we'll we'll wrap it up there, Cam. It's probably been our longest interview, perhaps up there with, with Wendell Wellman in terms of interview lengths. And again, we want to thank Dan for taking the time to sit down and talk to us and, and you listening at home for for sitting around and listening to Dan tell his stories. I hope you got something out of it too. But uh, Cam, what are we talking about next week? We are going back to the Xander Zone, baby. We are tackling Triple X Return of Xander Cage from 2017. You sound as excited about that as Vin Diesel does about acting. (laughs) And we'll also have an interview next week as well with uh, Scott Frazier, who wrote Triple X Return of Xander Cage. Yeah, and it's a really fascinating chat with Scott about uh, you know coming up with the third film after it wasn't really anything to do with the character in the second film, kind of like revitalizing the franchise almost. And yeah, he he was very upfront about the film. So look out for that next Friday as well. So uh, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to watch Triple X Three: The Return of Xander Cage and join us next week. Do not forget to follow us discreetly on social media at SpyHards, that's S-P-Y-H-A-R-D-S on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But until next week, listeners, Operation Dinner Out is well and truly closed.